Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. First, all physicians in attendance today will receive an AMA PRA Category 1 credit, and all other providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. The certificate will be emailed to you by Harvard around midsummer. Additionally, we encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Stephen Baer using the question section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the questions and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Stephen Baer is a reproductive endocrinologist at Boston IVF, practicing in the Brookline, Massachusetts and Providence, Rhode Island locations, as well as virtual appointments. In addition to his role at Boston IVF, he is a clinical instructor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Biology at Harvard Medical School, where he teaches the next generation of fertility experts and performs crucial, crucial research that affects IVF success and ovulation induction protocols for IVF. Dr. Baer received his undergraduate, undergraduate and medical degrees from Ohio State University in his residency training at Mount Carmel Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. He then completed his research fellowship in reproductive endocrinology in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Beth Israel Hospital in the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Pri prior to joining Boston IVF, Dr. Baer was a director of the in vitro fertilization program at New England Medical Center, as well as an assistant clinical professor at Tufts Medical School. He is a member of several professional societies, including Boston Obstetrical Society, New England Fertility Society, American Society of Reproductive Medicine, and the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, among others. Dr. Baer has published numerous articles and chapters, chapter books, books and chapters. He is one of the editors of the Boston IVF Handbook of Infertility, which is widely considered the permanent print resource in the field of reproductive medicine. Dr. Baer sees a wide spectrum of patients, including those with a history of infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, and patients interested in fertility preservation. All right, we're about to get started, and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Baer. Melissa, thank you very much for the, for the nice introduction. And as Alyssa said, I'm a re reproductive endocrinologist at Boston IVF, and I've been in practice for over 30 years, which you wonder where the time goes. But the vast majority of patients that I care for are dealing with infertility, and I see a fair number of couples who present to me with recurrent pregnancy loss. And I can say without reservation, and I know this has probably been your experience, these are some of the hardest couples and patients to care for. You know, they come into you, they're frustrated, no difficulty in getting pregnant, but they have these repeated miscarriages, looking for an explanation. Um, you start an evaluation looking for, looking for an underlying cause, and many times the evaluation doesn't uncover anything. So where do you go from there? And you know this is frustrating for the physician and more, more so frustrating for the couple. Um, the good news is, is that most couples with repeated miscarriage, with miscarriages, no matter what the cause, most of them will be able to have a viable pregnancy in the future. And I think that's what we have to convey to all of our patients. So what I'd like to do in my presentation is to give you an overview of the topic, talk to you about different treatment modalities that are available to your patients. And I hope at the end of the talk, it helps you better care for your patients, but also be better able to counsel your patients as well. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, so let's start here. I think the first thing to realize is that miscarriages are common. And miscarriages might just be Sorry about that. There's further evidence about the inefficiency of our reproductive systems. And it all starts early. You know, when you look at the ovarian reserve that every woman is born with, it decreases really from the birth on. Actually, the most eggs that any female has is five months into the pregnancy, where there's six to seven million, and then it declines to 2.5 million at birth, 600,000 at puberty. And when that 35-year-old woman decides she wants to try for a pregnancy, she has about 25,000 eggs, about 
0.01% of the eggs that she was ever born with. And as you know, when she sets off to try for a pregnancy, I think a lot of our patients, when they first try, they say, well, I'm going to achieve pregnancy in June, and then I'm going to deliver in, in April. They don't realize that it does take time. And if you take that 35-year-old woman, she has about a 15 to 20% chance of achieving pregnancy each month. So the end of four months, there's probably a 50% chance that she'll achieve a pregnancy. At the end of six months, 66%. And then after 12 months, there's about an 85% chance that she will have achieved a pregnancy. And we know in that 35-year-old, there's once she gets pregnant, there's about a 15 to 20% chance that that pregnancy can resolve in a miscarriage. And this gives you the average fecundity for a 35-year-old. But in the right graph here, we all know that with advancing age, the chance of pregnancy continues to go down per month. For years, we really didn't understand why. Was it an aging process that occurred in the uterus? Was it an egg factor? Almost all the data now, as you, you probably know, it's all the result of declining egg quality. And the heart of that declining egg quality is an increase in aneuploid in the eggs that older women ovulate. So as the monthly fecundity rate goes down, that's feared by a greater chance of a miscarriage as that, as that woman gets older. And so this was a very interesting study that it was a Danish study that they looked at over 600,000 women over several decades and looked at the, the rate of miscarriages according to the different age groups. And you know, you can see here in the 25 year old age group, probably about a, maybe a 10 to 15% chance of a miscarriage, 30, 15 to 20, 35, it's up to 20, it progressively goes up. That 45-year-old woman that uh, you may have in your practice, there's probably close to an 80% chance that any pregnancy she has results in a miscarriage. And this is all the result of a greater increase in aneuploidy in the eggs that older women ovulate. Now, what is the significance of a preclinical pregnancy loss? You know, a lot of our patients, some of our patients will come in and say, well, I've had two pregnancy losses and the day before I got my period, I had a positive pregnancy test on the urine test and then it became negative and it's happened two or three times. Are those patients, are those patients you really wanna launch off and, and do a recurrent miscarriage work? Well, this was a very, very nice study. It was published back in 1988 by Wilcox in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this study involved 220 women that were setting out to try for a pregnancy. And what they did is they did a urine pregnancy test right before the anticipated period. And they monitored these 220 women over 700 cycles. And 28% of the cycles, there was a positive um, Pregnant, you're in pregnancy test. Of the 28%, 43 out of 98 resulted in a preclinical loss, almost it was 22%. So what's the significance of these losses? These patients were then followed that had this preclinical loss. 35% got pregnant the next cycle and 95% of those patients had a successful pregnancy. So for my infertile patients, as well as those patients that present with recurrent pregnancy loss that only have these very early losses, I tell them, I kind of give them reassurance that it's probably not clinically significant and their odds are with them that they still will be successful in the future. And you know, we looked at the miscarriage rate of Boston IVF and we looked at statistics over 10 years. Now this was prior to the time that we were doing PGT testing. Uh, where we were screening for aneuploid. So these patients went through the IVF cycle. They all had embryos transferred during the cycle. So I looked at 20, close to 22,000 cycles. Over 9,000 have a positive serum HCG. So 43% pregnancy rate. Of these, 74%, 6,800 had ultrasound confirmation of the pregnancy. 93% of those had a positive fetal heart rate. 
and 89% of those that had a heartbeat seen on ultrasound went on to deliver. And when you look at the pregnancy loss rate from the time that those patients had a positive pregnancy test until the delivery, our pregnancy loss rate was 40% in the IVF population. So again, it comes down to miscarriages. Miscarriages are common. And the most common cause of a miscarriage is there's a chromosomal imbalance in the egg that's ovulated. Prior to a natural ovulation, the egg, as you know, undergoes one mitotic event, two meiotic events to create a haploid 23 chromosomal, 23 chromosome egg. And a good percentage of eggs that any woman produces has an imbalance in chromosomes. And most of those eggs, if they do fertilize, that woman doesn't get pregnant, but the vast majority do result in a miscarriage. Now, do any of these chromosomal abnormalities come from the sperm? Some do, but it's a very low percentage. When you look on the male side, probably two to 3% of sperm that are produced are aneuploid, and it's not age dependent. So whether that man's 50, 60, or 20, still two to 3% have that chromosomal imbalance. So chromosomal imbalances explain most miscarriages. And when you look at the different chromosomal abnormalities that we see, as a category, the most common type is trisomy. So over 50% of miscarriages due to chromosomal imbalances are due to trisomy. And the most common trisomy is 16. Polyploidy is the second leading cause of uh, chromosomal imbalances. Polyploidy, it's not necessarily coming from the maternal side. It just happens more than one sperm to penetrate that egg. Um, Turner syndrome, we know that Turner syndrome can result in a, a viable pregnancy, but most Turner syndrome uh, embryos do result in a miscarriage. And then a less common cause, a chromosomal cause of a miscarriage are your sex chromosomal imbalances. Now, the time of the miscarriage also, will give you a better idea, what are the chances of finding a chromosomal abnormality? Clearly, the early losses, the, you know, most miscarriages occur within the few, first few weeks um, after the menstrual period. And between four to seven weeks, probably 70 to 80% of those miscarriages are the result of a chromosomal imbalance. Between eight to 11 weeks, it's 50%. And in the second trimester, between 16 to 19 weeks, probably 30% of those miscarriages are the result of a chromosomal imbalance. And in these second trimester losses, the more common cause is cervical incompetence or some other uh, pathological problem with the uterus. How do we define recurrent pregnancy loss? And what kind of definition should we adhere to as we decide to evaluate the patient? Now, years ago, it was defined as three or more miscarriages. And that sense has changed. The current recommended definition of recurrent miscarriage or recurrent pregnancy loss by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine is defined as two or more losses prior to the 20th week of gestation. Now, what was in their previous definition is that pregnancy is defined as a clinical pregnancy documented by either ultrasound or histopathology. They actually, when they revised this definition, they did away with these criteria. So it's more open-ended. Now, this suggests that that patient I mentioned before who has had two biochemical or very early losses, that she would fall under this category. Well, I think this gives us more leeway when, it, when we feel it's appropriate um, to institute an evaluation, but clearly all you need is really two miscarriages to start to look for another factor. So when I have a patient that presents to me with recurrent pregnancy loss, the history is very important. You know, the first thing is I look at her age. And as I showed you with the previous slides, that you know, older women have a higher chance of aneuploidy, higher chance of miscarriages, much higher than a younger woman. But if you look at the miscarriage rate in these different age groups, what are the chances that that 30-year-old patient has a one miscarriage? probably 15% chance. What are the chances that she has 
two consecutive miscarriages, 2.25%. In the 35-year-old woman, maybe there's a 4% chance that she has a second miscarriage. 40-year-old, she having two miscarriages in a row. Since she has about a 40% chance of a miscarriage with her first pregnancy, there's about a one in six chance that she's had two miscarriages. And then you look at the 45-year-old, even after three miscarriages, what's the probability that she has three miscarriages? It's almost 50%. So I think looking at age, clearly the 30-year-old and maybe the 35-year-old that have had two or more, definitely you're gonna launch a, a you know, current miscarriage workup. But in the 40-year-old, you know, maybe you wait until the third miscarriage. So I think it's important, clearly the age will impact on your decision to move forward. The other thing that I wanna know is the gestational age that the losses occurred. Now that woman who had a miscarriage that occurred at 16 weeks, I wanna get the obstetrical records. The most common cause is cervical incompetence. I'm gonna take a history to see how the pregnancy went. Did she have just painless dilation and then delivered you know, that's going to explain, you know, uh, that patient's loss and clearly a surprise would be something she might consider in the future. If she tells me that the miscarriage occurred at 11 weeks, I want to take a look at that ultrasound. When in fact did the fetal demise happen? Because sometimes, you know, your patients come in and after 10 weeks, you do the ultrasound and you confirm that demise occurred at maybe seven or eight weeks. That's far different and if clearly the demise occurred at 12 weeks. And if that miscarriage occurs after 10 weeks, one of the things you're always concerned about is the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit further. I um, also wanna know whether the patient's had any successful pregnancies. Sometimes you have a patient who come in and she has a miscarriage, had a full-term delivery, two miscarriages, and maybe another full-term delivery. So what I'm thinking about in that particular patient, well, I'm not concerned about any underlying pathology that should have presented you know, any of those pregnancies reach, reaching term. But the one kind of thing I'm thinking about, maybe that patient has a balanced translocation. And that's the way that patients with a balanced translocation present to you, successful pregnancies and also miscarriage. The other thing that I wanna know from a history standpoint is how long did it take her to get pregnant? If she tells me that with each one of the two miscarriages, it took her a year to get pregnant, well, I'm also going to do an infertility evaluation as well as an evaluation to get a better understanding of the pregnancy loss. The other thing I want to know is if she had a DNA performed. If she had a DNA performed, was any of that tissue sent for a carrier? And I had a patient that I just saw yesterday, two previous miscarriages. First miscarriage was trisomy 15. Second miscarriage was 92 chromosomes polyploidy. So I had the chromosomal analysis in front of them. Both of them were abnormal. This explained her miscarriages and she really need, didn't need to go undergo any further work. Um, you know, from your standpoint, when is it good to be proactive? So you have a patient that's had a miscarriage and you're preparing to do the DNA, when is it appropriate to do the karyotype? I would say if she's on her second miscarriage, go ahead and send that placental tissue for a karyotype. Because if it's confirmed to be aneuploid, you have explained at least that miscarriage, maybe the first one was unknown and you really don't need to launch major investigation. Another thing I look at is the family history. If there's a family history of repeating miscarriages or stillborn infants, I'm concerned that that patient may in fact have uh, a karyotype or a chromosomal imbalance or reciprocal translocation. So what are the different causes of miscarriages? Probably 60% are unexplained. You have genetic, uterine, autoimmune, and other causes. So I first wanna talk about the underlying genetic causes that can put a patient at risk for a miscarriage. So probably three to 4% of couples with recurrent pregnancy loss one or the other will have a chromosomal arrange, rearrangement. And we see balanced translocations, inversions, ring chromosomes. What you're really looking for is the balanced translocation. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna order a karyotype 
on both partners. And we see two site types of translocations. We see a reciprocal balance translocation. We also see a Robertsonian translocation. So with the recipient reciprocal translocation, if the man is affected, then half of the sperm that are produced are going to be unbalanced. If they fertilize the egg, most cases a miscarriage are going to occur. The other half are either going to completely be normal or balanced for the translocation. But if, but if you look at this model, 50% of the sperm that are produced by that man should be chromosomally normal. Now, Robertsonian translocations are the other type of translocations we see. And this is the fusion of two acrocentric chromosomes. And what an acrocentric chromosome is, is a chromosome in which the centromere is very close to the end. So they may have a very short arm. So the acrosomic chromosomes include 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22. The most common Robertsonian translocation is between 13 and chromosome 14. So I would say in my practice, you know, is there a preponderance of one or the other in couples with recurrent miscarriages? I'd say it's probably 50-50. But your the follow-up, no matter what the type of translocation it is, it's really not going to change. So if either one of them has a translocation, you're going to send them for genetic counseling. And what I want the genetic counselor, what they can tell the couple is with this particular translocation, what are the chances that it can lead to, what are the chances of a miscarriage? That's one thing you want to know. What are the chances that if there is an unbalanced uh, translocation present, unbalanced, what are the chances that, that pregnancy can continue? Many of those are associated with congenital abnormalities. Um, and I think this helps with the couples or the couples when they're deciding what path to take. The other important thing to do is that balanced translocation would have been inherited from a parent, right? Now, some of these translocations are de novo, they're brand new, but for others, it's been inherited from a parent. And if they have any siblings, they should undergo, consider undergoing testing for this translocation. So in couples with this balanced translocation and repeated miscarriages, what kind of treatment options do they have? Obviously, continue to try on their own after they've you know, been consulted by the genetic counselor. If there's that unbalanced it, you know, embryo that can continue to develop, it won't be viable. Some will consider doing a CVS if they do achieve pregnancy to make sure that the fetus is un, uh, unaffected. Also, they can do the prenatal genetic testing. The other thing that we can do is IVF with pre-implantation genetics. I think and some couples, this would be an extreme, but some couples use donor gametes, whether it's donor egg or, or donor sperm to eliminate that genetic risk. But I want to present a patient to you that actually opted to do pre-implantation genetic testing. So her history, she was a 33-year-old woman, three miscarriages. She had one, two of the miscarriages were in the first trimester. The third one was very early. The testing that I did, I did check out the uterine cavity, it was normal. Intophospholipid antibodies were negative. And the karyotype confirmed that he had a balanced translocation between 13 and 18. So they went through IVF, the eggs were fertilized, we altered the embryos to day five, the blastocyst stage. And then an embryo biopsy was taken, they created a small opening of the zone of pellucida and they go in with a pipette and remove six to eight cells. It's a fascinating procedure. After the biopsy is taken, the embryo is frozen, and then we learned about the results two weeks later. So this was the genetic uh, report that I received. We had one, two, three, four of the embryos were unbalanced for the translocation. There was one that was monosomic, or 16 and 18, and we had actually two euploid embryos. So we used one of these euploid embryos that was transferred in a subsequent cycle, and she uh, achieved pregnancy and everything went well. What are uterine causes of miscarriages? So, you know, the uterus, obviously there's the functional capacity of the uterus that it's important in supporting the pregnancy, and then there are structural abnormalities. 
And we all know that during the menstrual cycle, estrogen is a predominant hormone during the first half of the cycle, progesterone during the second half. And of course, these hormone levels impact on the development of the endometrium and progesterone helps to prepare the uterus for implantation, helps support a pregnancy. And you know, for years, years ago, we were always kind of fixated that the progesterone deficiency might explain a woman's infertility or recurrent miscarriages. And, you know, one of the ways we assessed the, the you know, competency of the corpus luteum is we did a mid-luteal progesterone. If the progesterone is over 10, we said, well, you have enough progesterone on board, so there's no deficiency here. That's really not a good way to assess the luteal phase because progesterone is secreted in a pulsatile fashion every three, three hours. So when you draw that blood, you have no idea where you are in regards to the pulse. The other way we used to do it is we used to take an endometrial biopsy. And that pathologist would tell us the date of the endometrium and we compare the chronological date as well to see if there's a discrepancy. The bottom line is in the field of reproductive endocrinology, we no, no longer feel that a corpus luteal defect really exists. So we no longer do this testing in the infertile patient, as well as those with repeated miscarriages. Now, what kind of imaging can you do with the uterine cavity? I think there, you see all these, the list of the different uh, things that can be done to assess the, the anatomy of the uterus. The top two that I like, I like a hysterosophagogram and a 3D sauna history. And here you see a nice image of the uterus. It has a normal shape to it. I'm looking up here, it goes straight across. So, you know, there's no, you know, congenital anomaly. I don't see any filling defects in the uterus that might suggest polyps or fibroids. So this is a great, and if I had this view, I'd be satisfied with it. But a lot of times when you do the HSG, the uterus is antiflex or retroflex, and you don't get this two-dimensional view. So my number one test that I like to do is a 3D sauna histogram. So you can see that this gives me, you just have a beautiful shape to the uterine cavity here. You see the uh, overlying myometrium. And the other thing is it's a sauna histogram. So, you know, you can see if there are any polyps or fibroids in the cavity. So this is, this is really the number one test that I like to go to in assessing the uterine cavity. Now there are some, probably two to 3% of your patients that you see in your practice have a congenital anomaly. And I would say the most common congenital anomaly is the uterine septum. We also see patients with a unicornate uterus, less commonly controlled by cornerate uterus. Now, the ones that are most commonly associated with miscarriages, uterine septa, less likely, but in a unicorn uterus, but still a unicorn uterus has a higher chance of a miscarriage compared to if it's a normal uterus. There's no increase in miscarriages in the bicorner uterus, but there's a greater chance of obviously premature labor and malpresentation. So if you identify the patient to either have a bicorner uterus or a unicorn uterus, one of the other things you need to do is you need to do a renal ultrasound. So when the embryologically, when the mesonephric system was developing, the metanephric system was developing too that leads to the renal system. And the most common renal abnormality that you're gonna see is renal agenesis. Especially for the patient with a unicorn, they may be missing the kidney on the other side. Now of all these, like I said, the uterine, the septate uterus are the most commonly associated with miscarriage. And why do these uteri a woman at greater risk for miscarriage? Well, is that implantation, if it occurs on the septum, the blood flow to the septum is really not as good as the rest of the walls of the uterus, it may not be able to support uh, the pregnancy and then a miscarriage occurs. So how do you pick up? I, you know, I want to show you like the spectrum of septum abnormalities, at least to appreciate it on the HSG. Well, here's a normal HSG and you know, I'm looking up here at the top cavity, it goes straight across. This one right here on the upper right, you see a little bit of the depression coming down. And that many times is reported as an arcuate uterus. That's not associated with miscarriages. 
um, and is considered, considered a normal variant. In the lower left panel, you see a septum coming down to the mid part of the uterus. And here's a septum that comes all the way down to the cervix. Sometimes that septum will even be a vaginal septum and you'll have two separate cervices. Now, when you see a septum, you can't be absolutely sure it's a septum and you're gonna order a 3D ultrasound. So this was another patient of mine. You can see a depression down here. Um, she did have a septum. We did a 3D ultrasound and you, you're looking up here at the upper part, the fundal aspect of the myometrium. It's convex. Um, so I know that this is a septum and uh, not a bicornerate. And what they did is they measured the septum, they measured the distance from the two horns down to the base of the septum. Now, it's interesting, we have an arbitrary cutoff. If that septum is less than 10 millimeters, we consider that to be within the normal, you know, a normal variant, and we don't recommend surgery. If it's greater than 10 millimeters, then there's reason to do a hysteroscopy. In that battle bottom, I don't know if any of you have seen a septum, but it's very distinct. And this is an image, uh, the time of hysteroscopy. And you see the two uteri, hemiuteri on either side. And then there's a septum present. And it's a very easy surgery to perform. And there's two ways to cut the septum. Either you can do it by electric pottery, or you can do it by scissors. And you basically cut back right to the level of the tuberosity, and then you stop. And um, it's not a bad idea for these patients to have a repeat hysteroscopy. Sometimes the septum can reform again to some degree. Now, what are some of the acquired uterine anomalies that can potentially cause problems with fertility or carrying a pregnancy? Well, polyps, what about polyps? And is there any reason to be concerned, you know, or should you recommend removing of a polyp? I can tell you in the infertile population, polyps are common. And there's a lot of controversy. You know, we don't know what percent of women out there have polyps that are able to get pregnant and carry the pregnancy. Um, we just don't know. So I, I generally, you know, I will recommend hysteroscopic removal of polyps in certain cases. If a sonohistogram shows there's a two to three millimeter polyp, I'm not concerned about that. If it's between five to 10 millimeters, I think it might be a good to remove it. You know, there are going to be some cases that I've seen in my practice, and it's rare that you see there's a polyp that fills the, the whole uterine cavity, and clearly those, you know, are that affect that woman from a fertility standpoint, and they should be removed. Um, Asherman syndrome is another uh, condition that can explain miscarriages, and in this HCG image on, on the upper right, this is a patient of mine who had two miscarriages. I did the HSG, and, you know, obviously there's no septum but she had uh, filling defects throughout the uterus. She had Asherman syndrome. So she was taken to surgery and hysteroscopy was performed and all this scar tissue was resolved. And you know that didn't explain the previous miscarriages, but it was gonna hopefully prevent her in having another. What about fibroids? What about their role in really fertility and miscarriages and how do we handle fibroids? Well, you know fibroids are very common so probably women over the age of 35, probably 40 to 50% of fibroids, 40 to 50% of them have fibroids to some degree. And there's controversy on how to manage it. And when you go back, I finished my fellowship in the late 80s and the current feeling then, as well as into the 90s, is that any woman that had fibroid, who had infertility, miscarriages, a fibroid larger than two centimeters, you had to take her to surgery, perform a laparotomy, and remove the fibroid. So you can imagine, we were in the OR all the time removing these fibroids. And then the pendulum swung back in the other direction, realizing that many women have fibroids that really don't impact on their pregnancy and they're able to carry the germ without any problems. So the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, they did publish an article, and you can get this online, about they did research on fibroids and the role of surgery and the outcome. And the bottom line is the only fibroid that is confirmed to be detrimental to fertility and carrying a pregnancy is an intercavitary fibroid. 
So even if those fibroids are small, those are the ones that can, you know, interfere with that woman not only getting pregnant, but carrying a pregnancy. And if you identified one of those, you're going to remove it hysteroscopically. But other, what other reasons are there to think about removing fibroids? Well, if the patient has a lot of symptoms, you now she may have a few intramural fibroids, large ones. Maybe she doesn't have an intracavitary fibroid. But if she's symptomatic, you know, she has menorrhagia. She experiences pelvic pain, pressure on her bladder. You know, she's always having to urinate. Um, or if the, if the fibroid is cavity distorted. And sometimes when you do the HSG, you see really impingement on the fibroid, really displacing the uterus. That might be a reason to do a myomectomy or even the size. And I always look at the size of five centimeters or larger, that those are fibroids that you would talk to the patient, maybe you might consider having these removed. Now, another potential cause of miscarriages is some type of autoimmunity. And, you know, systemic lupus is one of the more common causes of autoimmune conditions. We know in that subgroup, they do have an increased chance of pregnancy loss. Um, many, of the, many of those patients who do have lupus have intercardiolipin antibodies that are affecting you know, the vascular supply to the pregnancy and might explain it. What's interesting is these patients typically don't have early miscarriages. They have later miscarriages, many of those after week 10. There also seems to be an association with antithyroid antibodies and miscarriages. There was a very interesting study you think, well, why don't we treat these patients with levothyroxine? And there was a great study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it involved one group of patients that their TSH level was normal, so they were euthyroid, but had antithyroid antibodies. And they were treated with thyroid levothyroxine. The other group served as, as controls, and they found that the, those patients that were treated with the levothyroxine, that their live birth rate was the same and the miscarriage rate was the same as well. So we no longer advocate just empirically treating those patients with levothyroxine. And the other autoimmune cause, of course, that we're most concerned about is the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is considered an acquired thrombophilia. The incidence in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss is probably between 5 to 20%. Others have estimated that it's higher. I'll be honest with you. I, I would say in my population, it's probably 5 to 10%. You know, I just don't see it all that often. But that's the reported rate. There was a study published some years ago that looked at those women who were not treated, but they confirmed that the presence of the antibodies confirmed a three to nine times risk of an SAB. It wasn't a large study. It involved 20 women with recurrent pregnancy loss. They had a positive anti-cardiolipin antibody. And this, this group refused, refused treatment. There was a 90% chance on this carriage, and 94% of those occurred within the first trimester. So the pathogenesis of the circulating antibodies that can cause vascular deficiency, insufficiency, placental thrombosis, where you get clotting in the vessels going to the pregnancy, and it also is felt to impact on trophoblastic function. Now, how do you diagnose uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? Well, this is the current Sapporo uh, classification is basically you need one clinical criteria and one laboratory criteria. And the clinical criteria could be there's a history of venous thrombosis, there's pregnancy morbidity, three or more consecutive losses before the week 10, an unexplained loss after week 10, and a premature birth before the 34th week of pregnancy. So those are all the clinical criteria that one of those you have to meet. There also has to be laboratory criteria as well. And the three tests that you're going to order on your patients, intercardiolipin antibodies, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies, and a lupus anticoagulant. Now, if either one of these antibodies is greater than 40, and you're looking at an IgM and IgG fraction, or you have a positive you know, you know, coagulant, lupus anticoagulant, just one of those plus the clinical, then that kind of reaches 
um, the diagnosis of APS. However, you have to repeat all these blood tests 12 weeks later to confirm the results because there could be a false positive. Sometimes if you do this testing soon after miscarriage, that you'll get a false positive, you repeat it, and then it's negative. So for those patients who 12 weeks apart, they have positive lipid antibodies, you know, they're gonna fit the diagnosis. And what kind of treatment do we offer these patients? Well, this is the ACOG recommendation. You're gonna give them prophylactic low molecular weight heparin plus a baby aspirin during the pregnancy until six weeks postpartum, because they're at greater risk for thrombotic events during that time. And with this approach, studies have shown that there's a 50% chance or 50% reduction in pregnancy loss. What about the inherited thrombophilias? You know, when the inherited thrombophilias came up like a clinical entity, um, there was a big question about whether it was associated with early pregnancy loss, fetal demise, fetal growth restriction, thrombotic events. So we were screening for all these inherited thrombophilias for all of our patients who were having, you know, very early losses. And I can't tell you the percent that were taking heparin. They probably need, didn't need to be heparin. You know that the rate of somebody being factor five light and having that mutation was probably seven to eight percent in the general population. So the bottom line is the current recommendations are we don't do this screening as a part of the recurrent miscarriage workup. And I think on the obstetrical side, they're now recommending that maybe these having these abnormalities don't really impact on or create an adverse pregnancy outcome. What are other factors that also might explain or contribute to miscarriage loss? Well, there are lifestyle issues. Cigarette smoking, as we know, is a reproductive toxin. It affects fertility, increased the risk of miscarriage. You know, the good news is that very few of our patients currently smoke. You know, secondhand smoke can be detrimental. Heavy alcohol intake can increase the relative risk of a miscarriage. Excess of three cups of caffeinated coffee. This one study reported at 2.2 times the relative risk. Now, what I generally tell my patients, whether they're trying to get pregnant or after pregnancy, they can have up to two cups. And I think that's what ACOG feels is safe, but maybe limited to two. And also there seems to be uh, increased risk of miscarriages according to weight, and that's poorly understood. Another clinical entity that we know increases the chances of miscarriage is polycystic ovarian syndrome. We know probably about five to 10% of the reproductive age group has this to some degree. And the rate of pregnancy loss is higher in this group. It's 30 to 50%. So probably sometimes some people quote like 40 to 80% of couples with recurrent miscarriages, of course it's gonna depend on your population, have underlying PCOS. And it's kind of, it's not well understood how these patients are at greater risk for a miscarriage. Could it be the obesity? Could it be the elevated level of LH or hyperandrogenism, or it might be due to the insulin resistance? Now, there were realizing that there's a higher rate of miscarriage in the PCOS group. There were a number of reports that came out to say, well, maybe giving metformin, which would you know, lower the insulin resistance, you know, change the, the hyperandrogenism, would that work? Well, I number my patients, I put them on that. And then there was this randomized control trial that came out back in 2009, 17 randomized controlled trials. They looked at this meta-analysis. The bottom line is their conclusion, metformin has no effect on the abortion risk in PCOS patients when administered before pregnancy. So after we learn that, we really don't feel that that's considered a modality. So that was the, the different causes. But like I said, you do all this work up, and 60% of those patients are unexplained. What kind of things, now, as I mentioned at the introduction, the one thing you can tell that patient is that no matter what the cause, if you identify an underlying cause or you don't of the miscarriages, her chances are very good that she will be able to achieve pregnancy on her own, no matter what the cause is. And this was a very nice study that was published in the Green Journal. They looked at 987 women with Three or more losses, 67% ultimately had a successful pregnancy. And they broke it down according to age, 
and the number of miscarriages that those women experience. And you can see if you have a woman that's 30 to 34 years of age, probably just under five years, she has a 60% chance of having a successful pregnancy. And it's going to be much higher in the younger group. What happens if you have a patient who's had six or more miscarriages? Well, here's this group right here. We have about a 50% chance, even if you've had six miscarriages, a 50% chance that they will ultimately have a successful pregnancy. So really, you never get to the point, unless it's a very dire situation, you never get to the point where you would tell that couple not to try anymore. Um, so I, I think that this is reassuring and you can use this information to help counsel your patients. And what do I offer? So if I have this couple in front of me, we've done all the testing, everything's normal. What are kind of options do they have? Well, the first is, is continue to try on their own. And I think for many couples, you know, realize, assuming that doesn't have any ovulatory problems, short time to conception, maybe less than six months, maybe that's the best thing for them to do is try on their own. What about ovulation induction, giving her clone or left result? The only reason I would consider that is if she has longer cycles. So if her cycles are, you know, 35 days or longer, I might put her on a left, you know, of course, electrozole just to improve the ovulation with the hopes that that might create better estrogen and progesterone levels that would help her achieve her pregnancy. What about other additions? What about baby aspirin? Well, there's some studies that show that giving baby aspirin may lower the chance of a miscarriage. Other studies show don't show that there's any effect. What about giving supplemental progesterone? I tell my, I offer it to my patients, but I also tell them that there's no data to suggest that it, it makes a difference. But I think for many couples after they've been through a mis, few miscarriages, they wanna feel like they're doing something different. And I don't think it's unreasonable to give baby aspirin per day and maybe start some supplemental progesterone, vaginal progesterone. And you can start, we generally will use endometrium, which is vaginal progesterone. You give twice a day. For known, you give once a day. And you could start that progesterone maybe five days after she ovulates by OPK, or wait until the first day she has a positive pregnancy test. Um, I think that's very reasonable. What about the immunotherapies? And if you Google, you know, alternative therapies for recurrent pregnancy loss, you'll see some case reports of IVIG, intralipids, granulocyte, you know, colony stimulating factor, which is nupogen, prednisone. The problem is, is a lot of these therapies are expensive. Many of these therapies are associated with significant risk, and there's really no good convincing evidence that they make a difference. So any of my patients that are asking me about this, I really don't feel comfortable with using it. Now, what about low molecular weight heparin? You know, I presented some data to suggest that that's a therapy you'd use in a patient with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. But there have been some studies looking at, even for those that don't have those antibodies, do they benefit from Lovenox? And there are some studies show that they make no difference. A recent study showed that it could increase the chances of a successful pregnancy. And I have offered this to my patients. These are patients of mine that have gone through IVF, transferring euploid embryos with recurrent miscarriages, no other explanation. And as a last uh, effort, I'll you know, offer that to them. And I generally give 40 milligrams a day, sub Q, and you can continue it until the 12th week of pregnancy. The other interesting thing is, is uh, TLC. And there are a number of studies that have been performed. You know, they're not perfectly designed, but they show that, you know, in groups of patients with repeated miscarriages, the first group was treated, they're pregnant. Okay, we'll see in 10 weeks and we'll do the ultrasound. The other group, they had frequent uh, interaction with the clinical staff, the physician, the nurse, they can, came in for daily ultrasound. And interestingly, they found in the latter group, they had a higher a live birth rate and a lower miscarriage rate. And there's no explanation for that. But you know, what I do with my patients if they've been through miscarriages, before I send them over to you, so we do like the, the ultrasound at six and a half weeks, they have an appointment with you at 10 weeks, I'll offer to them, I'll say, you can come in every week, we'll repeat the ultrasound for peace of mind or every other week, 
And I think many of them, just from a stress standpoint, that that helps them as they make the transition to your care. It's also, also counseling could be important. You know, for many of our patients, that this is a very stressful event they've been through. It's hard to go through one miscarriage, let alone go through two. So we have a social worker on my staff, and I know you have access to mental health professionals. And it's always good to talk to these patients to see how are they handling it, how are they feeling, and you know, make that referral out so that they can get that support as they move forward. The final option for these patients is the unexplained reproductive or uh, recurrent pregnancy loss is undergoing IVF plus PGTA. So we have the opportunity to go through IVF, we can do an endometrial biopsy, and we can screen that biopsy for translocation like I showed you. But we also can look at all the other chromosomes to see if there's any imbalance. So these are three different embryos who are biopsy. And we use next-gen sequencing, and for this first embryo that was biopsy for chromosome one, you can see the signals between those two lines. There are two copies of chromosome one, which is normal, two copies of all the other chromosomes. Until you get to 21, you see the peak above the line. So this embryo had trisomy 21. This one was complex abnormal, one copy of eight and 11, three copies of other chromosomes. And this embryo was 46XX chromosomally normal euploid embryo. Now, so we think doing the PGTA, we're able to flush out the ones that have aneuploidy, and we should be able to lower the miscarriage rate by putting back these euploid embryos. But there's controversy. There's controversy, as you know, in all of medicine and controversy about whether using PGTA for couples with recurrent miscarriages. So this was a study. It was a retrospective cohort, and they looked at 118 uh, couples who had um, excuse me, all of these couples had recurrent miscarriages. And they looked at 118 that did PGTA, the menuploidy screening, and 188 that were just managed expectantly. They were just trying to get pregnant on their own. What they found, interestingly, is that similar pregnancy rates and miscarriage rates were appreciated in both groups. It really didn't make sense. Further, the time to pregnancy was shorter in the expectant group. So good studies are lacking for this. You know, how I use PGTA is I kind of, in talking with a couple, I want to know how, how much stress they're feeling. And some women, after they've been through two or three, they say that absolutely they don't want to go through another miscarriage. I think PGTA in some populations does lower the chance of miscarriage. And also the older women. You know, say, for instance, you have a 40-year-old in front of you, has a 40% chance of miscarriage. And I think there's good data to suggest that IVF plus PGTA, you know, is beneficial. So clearly, this needs to be studied more to really get a final decision. So this is the last slide that I have. Um, you know, it's important as you approach your patients. Counseling is obviously vital important. You want to cover all the lifestyle issues. You know, some patients, we didn't really talk about this, but it's also worthwhile to investigate any potential environmental exposures that might affect their fertility or their chances of a miscarriage. You know, a social worker, as, as I mentioned, is important. The testing is very simple. You know, you're always going to do some assessment of ovulatory status. Many times, just by taking the menstrual history, that woman has 28-day menstrual cycles. You know that she's having normal ovulatory cycles. You're going to do a uterine evaluation. Um, I like the HSG, but I think my number one test I like to go to is the 3D sonohistogram. histogram. You're going to do karyotypes on both partners. And the autoimmune workup, you're going to do lupus anticoagulant, anticardial lipin antibody, and the anti beta 2 lipoprotein antibody. So it's a very simple workup, and um, it all can be completed within a month. And then you're going to have that patient follow up with you. And then you're going to counsel for moving forward. So um, I hope you all have found this to be useful. And I um, and, uh, hope you learned something. And I hope that this will help you when you counsel your patients moving forward. So what I'd like to do is just uh, turn this over to Alyssa for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Baer. That was a very informative presentation. 
We are now going to ben begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions panel in your uh, pane in the attendee control panel. Dr. Bear, first question is, anything you can recommend for the emotional issues people face when they have recur recurrent pregnancy loss? Well, that, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, I think all these, these couples, they're looking for something that they can do. And in many respects, they have that sense of feeling out of control. You know, I talked to you about the lifestyle issues. And many of our patients, they're doing all the right things. You know, they're, they're not drinking alcohol, not smoking. And they really have that sense of being out of control. And this is true that we hear this a lot from our infertile patients. You know, what I tell all my couples is that you just can't turn off the stress. And the worst thing is when anybody ever just tells them, well, just relax and everything will work out. And but we all know that that's not easy to do. So I encourage couples, you know, I have a lot of, um, a lot of my patients, they do yoga, meditation, uh, some do acupuncture, that puts them in, in a good place. Exercise uh, as well, as, lo as long as it's not excessive exercise. I think for many that gives them a better sense of control. And like I said, many times they can't do it on their own. And I encourage them to follow up with the social worker. I think many patients, they, they feel that it would appear as weak if they ever had to talk to the social worker. And I dispel that right from the bat, but many times that social worker uh, can be really helpful, not only as they're leading up to the pregnancy, but as well as in the future pregnancy as well. But that's a very good question. Thank you. I have another question that says, have you found any utility in adding antiphosphatidyl serum antibodies? I'm sorry if I said that wrong. No. So what you're referring to is the other uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. And I would say no, that there are some laboratories that will do a full panel. And you know they check the anticardiolipin and a beta 2 glycoprotein, phosphatidyl serine, as well as others. The only antiphospholipid antibodies that have been associated with miscarriages are anticardiolipin and, and anti-beta 2 glycoprotein. So I typically don't screen for those others because I don't think there's any clinical evidence that they're associated with pregnancy loss. Okay. Um, if a patient was prescribed empiric Lovenox, levothyroxine, and other medications, how long should we continue those medications? 12 weeks throughout the pregnancy? It's a good question because you now the levothyroxine, that's something that you're going to continue throughout the pregnancy. And if you have a, a patient that is hypothyroid, you want to periodically check the TSH level really almost like every month until 20 weeks, because you may find that you may have to adjust the dose, um, maybe increase it, but really that needs to be con continued until delivery. There aren't any good studies. I think the the if you're giving the you know, Lovenox, kind of empirically, like I mentioned, well, generally I'll stop it at 12 weeks. If they're taking it because of the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, they really should take it throughout the pregnancy until six weeks postpartum. Okay. Um, I have a mom who has infertility and was diagnosed with APS. She did conceive and is consider, con concerned her daughter could have APS. She would like to be heard to be tested before starting an OCP. Is this reasonable? That's that's I've never had that question before, but <laughs> I I don't think it's an issue because the APS that's an acquired um, thrombophilia. You know, if she had an inherited one, it was picked up one way or another. You know, factor five protein CNS. Literally, that can be passed down, but. I don't think there's any reason to suspect that her daughter would have APS as well. Great, thank you. Um, oh, someone else also recommended Resolve of New England as a support group for these patients, and I we definitely agree. Oh, that's 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 a very good. I should have put that in my presentation. And Resolve is a patient advocacy group. We actually got started in Massachusetts, and now it's a national organization, and. They, they're wonderful. They, they provide a lot of support for couples, no matter what their situation is. And 
you might all just consider going to the website, it's resolve.org, and that's a wonderful resource uh, for your patients. Thanks for mentioning that. The next question is, after a first trimester loss, how long should a woman wait before the next pregnancy? Well, you know, years ago, um, it was recommended the woman should wait three months, and that's what we told our patients. And then there was an article published in the Green Journal, and they followed patients, women who didn't follow those rules. Many of them got pregnant the first cycle after the miscarriage or the second. And when they looked back, there was no increased risk of pregnancy loss. So um, what I tell my patients is after a miscarriage, I, at the very least, it's good just to wait a month. I mean, emotionally, they have to get back on their feet again. You know, physically, I think after one month, you know, after the miscarriage, I think they're fine to, to go ahead and try again. But, you know, it's interesting how we all, and I'm sure many of you told your patients the same thing, you have to wait three months. And it really wasn't based on any science, but now we have the science to really refute that recommendation. That was our last question. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. If you have any other questions, please contact myself, Alyssa Cooper at ecooper at bostonivf.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you complete the, you can complete the survey and provide your feedback to help with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a, a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF and Dr. Baer, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Baer, and thank you, everyone. Have a great day.